The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so uh, today we're continuing in oxidation reduction. And so we started this a little bit last week, and we talked about uh, briefly about balancing equations which, as you recall, is really about counting. So it's not uh, an intellectually challenging topic and just requires uh, you know, making sure that you've counted everything appropriately. So you have to be a little bit careful but doing it, but it's really not too hard. So uh, being able to balance oxidation reduction equations then allows you to go on and do the, to talk about the things that we'll be talking about today. So today we're going to cover electrochemical cells, Faraday's law, and the relationship between delta G and uh, cell potential. So everyone could quiet down a little bit. I can hear a lot of uh, noise in the background. I realize you're still settling down and pulling out your notes. Um, so as, as I've mentioned all the way through the lectures I've given so far, that you have to remember all the things you've learned because they're going to come back again. So today we'll be back to thermodynamics and talking about spontaneous reactions in delta G. So this all ties in together. This un these units are really more applications of things that you've already learned in the first half of the course. And currently we're in, in chapter 12. So an electrochemical cell, what is an electrochemical cell? Uh, well, it's any device in which you have an electric current. An electric current is just the flow of electrons through a circuit. And it's either, the current is either produced by a spontaneous reaction, see where uh, delta G is going to come into this. It's either produced by a spontaneous reaction or used to bring about a non-spontaneous reaction. So you can use uh, an electrochemical cell to force a non-spontaneous reaction to go. So a battery, which most of you are, are familiar with and use in many of uh, the uh, gadgets that you have, is really just a collection of these uh, electrochemical cells. And as we'll see, um, perhaps at the end of today's lecture or next time, that all these principles that you're learning about oxidation reduction apply to oxidation reaction reactions that happen in your body. So the same, same principles that apply for a battery apply for uh, chemical reactions that are in your body that are important for human health. So we'll talk about that as well. So here is an example of an electrochemical cell. This is a pretty simple electrochemical cell. So we have uh, two, two beakers here. And uh, we have electrodes, which are connected uh, by wires. And they're connected to something that can read the uh, current that's coming through the system. There's also a salt bridge, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So this would be a fairly uh, simple one that one could construct. And uh, I like to joke about you know, what people would say in the old days when I go and do uh, fundraising stuff for MIT and meet uh, alumni that graduated from this place a really long time ago. And they probably say, well, yeah, before we could even do our problem sets, you know, we had to make our own batteries to be able to uh, get some electricity to see by. So uh, we don't, your, your life is a bit simpler now. You should hear some of the, the old stories of what MIT students had to go through. All right. So this is a schematic view of what you just saw. And we'll walk through and talk about all the different parts of the electrochemical cell. So this, uh, again, uh, I drew this, this actually myself. I think actually I stole maybe parts of it. Or did I draw the whole thing? I, I can't quite remember. But um, again, this is my depiction of the beaker. As I've mentioned in the past, art was really not my strength. So this is a beaker over here filled with liquid. In this case, uh, we have ions dissolved in uh, the solution. We have zinc plus 2 and, um, and sulfate dissolved. Another beaker over here. Uh, in, this, in this beaker, we have a zinc electrode. And this is at the anode. And so this is zinc solid, a piece of zinc solid stuck into this beaker where you have uh, the solution. There's a wire connecting two electrodes. On the other side, we have the cathode. And this is made of copper solid. And it's sitting in a beaker that has a copper plus 2 and also sulfate in it. 
And so uh, let's look at what would happen if this reaction were to run. So over here uh, at the anode, we have zinc solid being oxidized to zinc plus two. So the reaction is, is shown down here. So this electrode actually gets consumed during the reaction. You actually have solid being converted to zinc plus two uh, in solution. So you have a, a change in phase. And as that happens, two electrons are generated from that reaction. And the elect electrons then will go through the wire, and the current will be red. They'll go through the wire over to the copper solid. And over here, they'll pass into this beaker, and the electrons will find the copper plus two, as shown in this equation down here. And this will form copper solid. So you're actually going to have copper, extra copper, plating onto the electrode. So this electrode is going to get bigger, uh, and this one will be consumed in the course of the reaction. And so this is a, a little picture over here, the electrons coming into the copper solid, finding the copper plus two, and the copper plus two then is reduced um, at the cathode to copper solid. And the blow up on the other side shows the copper solid uh, once electrons leave, uh, say the zinc solid electrons leave, you form zinc plus two. So these are sort of blow ups of the reactions that are happening uh, at the uh, cathode and anode. And so as this happens, you'll see there'll be a change in the charge. So here we have uh, zinc solid or zinc zero going to zinc plus two. So to balance that charge, there's a salt bridge, and you'll have some kind of ion come in to neutralize the charge. And here we have chloride minus. On the other side, we're going from copper plus two to copper zero. And so you'll have a positively charged ion coming in to help neutralize that, that change in charge. So over here, something's being oxidized at the anode. Anode is where you have oxidation and something's being reduced at the cathode. Cathode is where you have reduction. So we could uh, write that cell in a little bit more simple fashion. Instead of having that picture, we can uh, convey to others what that picture showed us by this equation here. So we have the two reactions going on. We have the zinc reaction, which is shown on one side. And that reaction was the zinc solid going to the zinc plus two. And this single line here represents a change in phase, a phase boundary. So solid going to uh, an ion dissolved in aqueous solution. The two lines right here represent the salt bridge. So this uh, equation then is telling you one reaction going on in one beaker separated by the salt bridge, this would be the reaction going on in the other beaker. And so over here, we have copper plus two aqueous with a single line for the phase boundary going to copper solid. So if you see this kind of notation, you can envision that electrochemical cell with the two beakers, the wire and the salt bridge, and you uh, can, this is reaction going on on one side and the reaction going on on the other side. So as, as I mentioned, in that particular electrochemical cell, zinc is being consumed, zinc solid is being consumed, it's being converted to zinc plus two, whereas copper solid is being deposited onto the electrode. So in that case, you have copper plus two aqueous going to copper solid, so that's being deposited. And the amount of zinc that's consumed and the amount of copper that's deposited is going to be proportional to the charge that passes through the system or to the electrons that pass through the system. And that makes sense because if you have uh, zinc solid going to zinc plus two, you have two electrons uh, formed which would then go through to the other side. So the amount of charge that's going to go through has to do with the amount of zinc that's consumed, which would also then have to do with the amount of copper that's deposited when the electrons get to the other side. And so this is a law. We don't have very many laws in chemistry. A lot of times we have theories uh, that help to explain observed uh, 
information. Chemistry really is an experimental science, so we observe a lot of things and then we try to rationalize why they're true. There are not a whole lot of laws, but this is, this is one of them. All right, so let's just kind of look at little movies of, of, of this uh, procedure of what is, is happening. And here we're going to see oxidation uh, at the anode. So we can pretend this is our solid uh, electrode here, and we have, say, the zinc. And here's the aqueous part, so these are water molecules. And you're going to see electrons leave, go up, and uh, then you're going to have the solid is going to uh, then be oxidized to, in this case, zinc plus two, and it'll go into solution. So let me just play this for you. You can see, you can actually see the electrons leave in this movie, which uh, is uh, interesting. So, okay, there they go. There are the electrons leaving. Oh, and you've, uh, you've freed up some of the solid, and now you've freed up again. So now we have uh, zinc plus two. We had zinc solid, but now, uh, we've uh, consumed some of our electrode, and it's in solution. So we can, now you know what you're looking for. I'll just play that uh, one more time. Okay, the electrons are heading off into the wires, and uh, you're consuming your electrode. All right, so let's go the other direction. The electrodes, the electrons that left and passed through the wire are now coming down to the cathode, and so those electrons can come in and uh, reduce, say, copper plus two, forming copper solid. So we have copper plus two. Here come the electrons. Here come the electrons. And so now you've plated those two copper plus two ions. They've become copper solid. And now your cathode has expanded. You've added uh, more metal onto it. It's been deposited or plated onto this uh, electrode. And again, the amounts are going to be equal. So there's Faraday's law would tell you that it's all going to be proportional. The amount that's consumed, the amount that's produced, is all going to be equal to the number of electrons that pass through the system. So let me just show you uh, one more example of why this could be useful in terms of the plating. Um, so in this uh, little experiment, we have a steel spoon. And uh, it's going to be the steel spoon will, will act like an electrode and get plated with copper. So and this has. This steel spoon will have a thin coating of copper deposited on it. There's the copper wire. The cell consists of an anode of pure copper, a solution of copper sulfate, and as a cathode, a spoon. There is no net reaction, but copper metal is transferred from the anode to the cathode. It's pretty. So it's pretty simple. So then you can see how it can get deposited uh, on top of this, which was acting as an electrode in this case. All right. So as you probably figured out, you, oh, yeah. It's, you often will have to figure that kind of thing out. In the example that I showed you, it was set up to work like that. Um, but as we'll, we'll talk about, it depends if it's going to be a spontaneous reaction or a non-spontaneous reaction. So if you have a, a cell where it's a spontaneous reaction, you can figure out which is going to be a, which reaction will occur at the cathode and which will occur at the anode. There's only one, one way you can put those, if you have particular ingredients, for it to be spontaneous. And so we'll actually talk about that at the end of, of the lecture. But in that particular case, it was just you know, stated as, you know, this is the reaction happening here and here. But which will go which place will depend on whether you want it to be a spontaneous or non-spontaneous. That's a good question, and we'll definitely come to that. So uh, in terms of uh, Faraday's law, it's proportional, and that means you can do calculations. So one could figure out how much zinc would get consumed or how much copper would get deposited 
if you had a particular current <coughs> flowing for a particular amount of time. And uh, these are actually uh, fairly, fairly simple calculations to do, and we'll just go through one of them. So um, the first step would be to figure out how much charge went through the system. So we have Q, magnitude of, of charge in coulombs, which uh, unit is C, uh, is going to be equal to the current, and that's in amperes, or A. And uh, here is a useful conversion for you to remember, and this will be given to you on, on a test, uh, times the amount of time. So how much current times time will tell you the, uh, the magnitude of the charge. So that's, that's pretty simple, and that equation would be given to you as well. So uh, we have, uh, we're told that we had one, uh, one amp uh, for one hour, and we've converted it to seconds so you can get the right, the right units. We can find out the magnitude of the charge. Then in coulombs, because these units multiplied together will get you coulombs. So then uh, step two is to figure out how many moles of electron that charge is equal to. And uh, we have Faraday's constant, uh, which will also be provided to you. And its units, you can, um, using the conversion, coulomb per mole. And it also is equal to one Faraday, which is usually kind of a squiggly kind of uh, F symbol here. And so then if we go through and we use uh, Faraday's constant, we can figure out that that number of coulombs uh, convert to moles. And so you would get 0.0373 moles of electrons. So this is just a conversion using Faraday's constant. And then we have to figure out how many moles of the particular element, zinc in this case, or copper, are deposited and convert to grams. So we know now how many electrons went through our system. And so now we just need to figure out for every one mole of zinc consumed, how many moles of electrons would have left. And in the particular example we had, what would it be? How many electrons? Two, as we went from zinc to zinc plus two, so we're talking about two electrons for our every mole of zinc. And then we can calculate grams uh, per, uh, we, can cal we can calculate moles and convert to grams using the uh, molecular mass of zinc, which we can look up. So we get 1.2 grams uh, are going to be consumed at that particular time with that kind of current passing through the system. We can do the same thing with copper. So we have the same number of moles of electrons that are going through our system. And now we just need to know for every one mole of copper deposited, how many electrons are required. And that is two again, because we were taking copper plus two to copper solid. So we need two electrons for every one uh, mole of copper that gets deposited. And then we can use uh, the molecular mass to find out the number of grams. And since these weigh a very similar amount, it's about the same, uh, the same number of, of grams. Um, if there was a very difference in, mo in molecular mass, then that wouldn't be true. These are not always near each other. All right, so that's just how you do one of these problems. They're really pretty simple. And there are, there are some of those at the end, actually, of the problem set. So the problem set, the book has things in a sort of different order. So uh, you'll be able to do the first part of the problem set and the end of the problem set at this point. All right, so let me just introduce you to a couple of different kinds of electrochemical cells. So up until this point, we've only talked about electrochemical cells where something was deposited or consumed. But you can use electrodes that are inert, i.e., they don't get consumed in the reaction. Or um, and an example of that is platinum electrode. So uh, as it says, they're not always consumed or produced. You can have an inert electrode, such as a platinum. So in this case, we have the platinum electrode to transfer the electrons around. But the reaction that's going on is all in solution. So this side would be the same 
Uh, this is the, the cathode or the reduction reaction. So we have, again, the copper plus two. Uh, two electrons will come through the system and plate more copper solid on, onto the electrode here. But on the other side, the anode, where you have the oxidation, the oxidation reaction is happening all in solution. So the platinum electrode is not involved in that. So in this case, we have chromium plus two going to chromium plus three with one electron. So that is another type of electrochemical cell. And so we can, uh, we can write this and look, uh, look at the notation for this kind of cell. So in, in this case, you'd put the platinum solid in the equation on this side. We have a single line, meaning there's a phase boundary. So we're going from solid uh, to, to something in solution. And now here is our reaction that happens at the anode, and it has a comma in between. So this indicates that chromium plus two is going to chromium plus three, but there's no phase boundary between those, so there's a comma. Uh, then on the other side, the two lines indicating the salt bridge, and then on the other side we have the copper plus two aqueous, the line that does indicate there's a phase boundary uh, going to copper. So uh, this would be for our anode reaction of chromium going to chromium plus three in one electrode, and our cathode reaction, copper plus two plus two electrons going to copper solid. So you'll see this kind of notation in these problems as well. All right, another example of an inert elect electrode um, that sometimes used the hydrogen electrode. Um, so often you will see this, and actually in the back of, of your book, you will see this as well, the standard hydrogen electrode, abbreviated SHE. So often you'll see in papers or in your book that the, they often need to mention how these redox potentials were measured, and it's often said it's measured against SHE, and that's what that stands for, the standard hydrogen electrode. So you can have the hydrogen electrode on either side at the anode or at the cathode. So uh, over here would be an example when it's at the, at the cathode. And in this case, H plus is being reduced. And so we have H plus, and that's aqueous, the line for the phase boundary to H2 gas. And then you have also a phase boundary to the platinum solid. So this is uh, combining the platinum and, and the hydrogen. And uh, then on the other side, if you had uh, it reacting as an anode, in this case, H2 is getting oxidized. So you have the platinum solid phase boundary uh, hydrogen gas, so that would be uh, oxidation state zero, phase boundary uh, to H plus uh, aqueous. So you can use this sort of combination of the platinum and the hydrogen uh, electrodes as either cathodes or anodes. And so just one example of what this sort of thing would look like. So here we have in our electrochemical cell. Now on this side, we just have the, the zinc electrode, which we mentioned in the beginning, zinc solid, and then that would be zinc plus two in solution. We have our wire, our salt bridge, and in the other beaker on the other side, we have uh, some glass tubing where you would have hydrogen gas uh, in, uh, going through into the system. Um, you also have through that uh, the platinum uh, electrode, platinum solid, and you have HCl in your beaker, so that would be H plus uh, in your beaker. So here it's the cathode reaction. So you would be going from H plus to H zero gas. And so as you have the reaction over here, um, zinc solid to zinc plus two, electrons would come along and uh, they would convert H plus to H, H two. And the electrode here is the inert platinum electrode. And so here's my attempt to draw little H two uh, gas bubbles going on. So this is another type of electrode that you should know the, the uh, notation for. It doesn't really change how you do problems particularly, but it's important to know what it stands for. And again, this is uh, on the other side. We have already talked about, about that kind of anode. All right. 
So this is, of course, always things that I, things that I really like to do, because what I like to do is to go back to something you've already learned and make connections between different units of freshman chemistry. So we're back to delta G. So um, we're going to now talk about cell potential. And this is abbreviated delta E. Cell potential is often called cell voltage. And it's also called the electron motive force, or EMF. So you'll see all of those different words, and they all sort of stand, they stand for the same thing, this delta E term, and uh, the connection with free energy. So when the electrons flow, that creates a potential difference, a delta E, between the electrodes in the circuit. And so the overall free energy of the cell is related to this cell potential by the following equation. So we have delta G for that particular electrochemical cell is going to be equal to minus N, which is the number of electrons that are going through the system, times Faraday's constant, which we talked about a few minutes ago, and delta E, the cell potential uh, for that particular cell. So there's a nice connection between these two, and that'll be really useful in doing these problems. So um, we can also talk about standard states here. And the same equation applies whether you're talking about delta G at any particular time and delta E at any particular time, or you're talking about the delta G and the delta E in their standard states. So again, uh, this means the same thing that it has before, uh, delta E naught. The naught means that you're, you're at the standard states. And uh, delta G, of course, uh, delta G naught is also delta G in the standard state. And uh, units, of course, are important when you're talking about any kind of delta E or cell potential. You're talking about things in volts as the units. All right, so now what those equations mean is if you calculate a delta E for the cell, the cell voltage uh, or the cell potential, you can figure out whether the reaction will be spontaneous or not, because you can use that equation uh, and look at, with that particular delta E, will delta G be negative? Will it be a spontaneous reaction? So the first thing we need to learn how to do is how to calculate the cell potentials or the electromotive force. And then we, can, we already know how to convert that to delta G. So let's, let's look at this equation here and uh, calculate what the delta E, the cell potential for this particular electrochemical cell that we've been talking about. So the reaction at the anode, which we mentioned, is this zinc reaction. And this is an oxidation. The reaction at the cathode was the reaction with copper, copper plus two and two electrons going to copper solid and that was our reduction reaction. And so now we can just use a simple equation to calculate uh, delta E naught if we're using the standard reduction potential for the reaction at the cathode uh, minus the standard reduction potential for the couple at the anode. And the point that I want to make here is that in this fairly simple equation, this term, this just E naught here, is the standard reduction potential. So you don't want to put in something other than that. So don't, don't mess around with changing signs of reactions. All you want to do is enter a reduction potential here and a reduction potential here, and then this equation will always work for you. And you'll see what I mean, I think, a bit more uh, when we put that in. But if it's the reduction potential, you'd be looking up copper 2 plus to copper solid. Reduction potential, you're looking up zinc plus 2 to zinc solid. You're, you're not caring about which, which of these reactions is an oxidation or which is a reduction at this point. You figured it out by which is at the cathode. If you know what's at the cathode and you know what's at the anode, then you enter in the reduction potential. So let's, let's do that. 
and you can look up the standard reduction potentials in your book. There's a table in Chapter 12, and there's also a table at the end of the book in Appendix 2. And you can look up the values, uh, and here they're written as reduction potentials, and that's what you'll see in the table, and uh, that's what the um, information that you can look up. And then you have your equation, and you will enter in the reduction potential for the reaction at the cathode, and enter in the reduction potential for the reaction at the anode, and here you'll get out a positive value, 1.103 volts. So again, this is the copper reaction, this is the zinc reaction. So the reason why I want, I'm sort of trying to jump up and down about the fact that you should enter in reduction potentials is because if you go, if you play around and all of a sudden switch the signs, then you're going to come out with the wrong answer. And the, one of the important points about this answer here is, is delta E positive or negative? Because that's going to tell you if the reaction is spontaneous or not. So if you do clever things and switch the signs for these around, you'll often always come out with the wrong answer there, which then affects all the problems that you do after that. So as long as you use this equation and always enter in a reduction potential, you'll be fine and you won't have any of these problems. All right, so is the flow of electrons spontaneous for this particular cell? So people are saying yes, and that's the right answer. And the way that we know that is because we remember this equation con um, comparing delta E and delta G. So here, if this one is, is positive, then this term will be negative, because this is number of moles, which is always positive, and Faraday's constant is always positive. So if we have a positive value here, then the net sum is negative. This will be negative, and that will make uh, it's spontaneous. So if delta E is positive, delta G will be negative. Delta, and this is true, again, if it's delta E naught, delta G naught, uh, same equation. So if delta G is negative, will it be spontaneous? And uh, the answer is yes, uh, back to previous units. So um, in, in some of the problems in your book that you'll work, they'll tell you that uh, this, should, this is a spontaneous electrochemical cell, and then you can figure out which reaction had to be at the anode or which one had to be at the cathode for that uh, through looking, calculating the delta E and then figuring out is it positive or negative. Therefore, delta G must be uh, positive or negative, spontaneous or non-spontaneous. All right, so what do you call it? if there is a spontaneous reaction, so here are some terms that you should know. You have a galvanic cell, and that's an electrochemical cell in which the reaction is spontaneous. So it can generate an electron, electric current. And your book uses this and will say, oh, this is a galvanic cell, and already then you should know something about that reaction. Uh, the other option is an electrolytic cell, and in this case, energy has to be um, provided uh, to the circuit to carry out a non-spontaneous reaction. So sometimes you might just want that non-spontaneous reaction to go, and then you will have to uh, supply some form of, of energy to get that reaction to work. And in, in the body, um, there are both of these kinds of reactions. Sometimes you would have a reaction, an oxidation rea reduction reaction that's spontaneous, and that could be used to produce some kind of energy. It would be coupled to an energy generating process in the body. Other times, the body needs a reaction that's unfavorable to go, and it has to also supply energy to get that reaction to go. And we'll talk about biological examples of these as well. All right, so then just the brief summary for this part. If the cell operates spontaneously, that can be determined by the, uh, the delta E. A positive value means a negative value, so that will be spontaneous. And you can get your delta E's uh, from standard reduction potentials for the half reactions involved. All right. Now we're going to think about what it means 
if we have certain standard reduction potentials. If you have a standard reduction potential that's a large positive number, or if you have a standard reduction potential that's a large negative number, or if you're somewhere in between, what does that tell you about the properties of those particular elements? So a large positive standard reduction potential means that the element is easy to reduce. So let's look at an example for this. An example, we have uh, F2 gas plus two electrons going to 2F minus. And this has a standard reduction potential of plus 2.87 volts. And that is a large positive number. So what that's going to mean is that this is favorable in the direction as written. And favorable means it's easy to add electrons. This wants to be reduced to F minus. It's happy that way. If it has a large positive sign for, for the standard reduction potential, then delta G will be negative, which will be uh, favorable or spontaneous in that direction. So this is a favorable reaction. F2 is easy to reduce. It wants to be reduced. So is it a good oxidating um, oxidizing agent. Yes. So again, a good oxidizing agent oxidizes other things and is reduced itself. So it runs around and tries to oxidize other stuff, which means that it gets reduced, which is what it wants to be. It wants to be reduced. So this is a good oxidizing agent. So if we look at the couple here, F2 um, slash F minus, this reduction couple with the large positive value, what we can say is that the oxidized species, and that's this one here, the F2, is very oxidizing. It's a good oxidizing agent. And this is a table from your book, so it's not in your handout, but you can look it up. And uh, here's the page number. And this is the one we just looked at, F2 to F minus. And it says right on the top, oxidized form, which is F2, is strongly oxidizing. So it, like, it has a big positive number. It's at the very top of the table. Big positive number. It likes to be reduced, i.e., it likes to oxidize other things. So now let's go to the bottom of the table and see what we can say about this uh, lithium uh, plus lithium solid couple. So that had a large negative value for the standard reduction potential. And that means it's hard to reduce. So let's look at that. So we have lithium plus one plus one electron going to lithium solid. And that reduction is listed with a standard reduction potential of minus 3.045 volts. So that's a large negative number. So if it's a large negative number, that means it's hard to add electrons. This direction, as written, is not particularly favorable. Lithium plus one doesn't want to go to lithium solid. Uh, it's hard to add that electron. That direction of the reaction, the forward direction, would not be very favorable. Delta G would be positive, would be a large positive number. So it doesn't want to go in that direction. So is, is lithium plus one a good oxidizing agent? No. But it's a good reducing agent. Or lithium solid is a good reducing agent. So lithium solid likes to reduce other elements. It likes to get oxidized. It this reaction is favorable in the reverse direction. So the lithium solid over here would be very happy to be lithium plus one. So lithium solid is a good reducing agent. So if we look again at this couple, the lithium plus one lithium couple with the large negative standard reduction potential, we find that the reduced species, in the reduced species here is lithium solid, the reduced species is very reducing. 
So it wants to be oxidized itself. It wants to reduce other things. It's a good reducing agent. So if we go back to our table down here, it says reduced form is strongly reducing. So up here on the far corner on the left-hand side, the oxidized form is strongly oxidizing. Down here on the right-hand side, the reduced form is strongly reducing. So you'll be asked about various things in between. Is something a better oxidizing agent than something else? Is something a better reducing agent than something else? And if you remember uh, these parts, oxidized form up here where, where E standard reduction potential, E naught is positive, oxidized form is strongly oxidizing. Down here where you have a negative number, reduced form is strongly reducing. So this makes sense from what you learned before, actually. And this is another table from, from your book, so I didn't put it in the handout. But we talked about uh, fluorine over here. We talked about lithium. This has a big positive number over here. So it's easy, it's, you've easy to reduce. These are good oxidizing agents. And on the other side, these want to be oxidized. They're good reducing agents. Fluorine minus has a noble gas configuration. And lithium plus has a noble gas configuration. So it makes sense from some of the trends you talked about earlier in terms of whether something's favorable or not, whether it likes to be in the plus one state or prefers to be in the minus one state can all come out of these, oxi uh, these uh, reduction potential numbers. And you can figure out you know, which direction is favorable, the reduction or the oxidation. So let's, let's take a look at an example here uh, of this, uh, this cell potential and think about what are good oxidizing and reduction, uh, oxidizing agents and reduction agents. So there are these two, two couples over here we're going to look up. And that's hard to see, so I'll just go back to this. All right, so what's happening in this particular reaction? So we have two irons plus three and two electrons going to two iron plus two. So is this a, a reduction or an oxidation? So as written, it's a reduction. So that means it would take place at the anode or cathode at the cathode. All right, the other reaction we have is 2I minus going to I2 solid plus 2 electrons as it needs to be balanced. So this would be an oxidation. And so it should take place at the anode. So now we can calculate the cell potential for this particular reaction, the delta E naught for the cell, and that will equal the uh, delta E for the cathode reaction minus the delta E for the anode reaction. So the delta E for the cathode reaction, uh, and you were given this in, in your handouts, we have plus, we have plus 770 volts minus plus 535 volts for the reaction happening at the anode. And so that will equal 0 0.235 volts. And so will that be spontaneous? Yes, so it will be spontaneous. So delta E is positive, so delta G will be negative. So we'll have a spontaneous reaction. Now let's consider which are the better oxidizing and reducing agents. So for better, better oxidizing agent, is it iron plus 3 or iodide 2? Which is a better oxidizing agent? And we can go back to the chart. Here's the iron, 
and below it is the iodide reaction. So which is better? So iron, I heard, I think I heard some people say iron plus three. So that should be a better oxidizing agent. So again, if you look at where they are, the things on this side at the top are the most oxidizing or the best oxidizing agent. So iron plus three is there. It's going to be uh, better. And we can also think about this in terms of the spontaneous reaction. This is spontaneous, and the iron plus three here is is being, is being reduced, so it's acting as an oxidizing reagent, and that's causing the reaction to be spontaneous. And if we talk about the better, better reducing agent, so the reducing agent is the thing that wants to get oxidized, and if we consider I minus or iron plus two, which is better? I minus is going to be better. And again, it's down here. Down here, we have the reduced forms are strongly reducing. This is the reduced form, so it's on this end of the table. Also, uh, that's the reaction that's happening here, and it's spontaneous. It has, and if you talk about the two reduction potentials, you can figure that out. Okay, see you on Wednesday.